Welcome on in, everybody, to another edition of the Porpoise Pod. Opening with you alongside my co-host Alejandro Solana as the Miami Dolphins getting ready for Week 18 against the New York Jets. They do not control their playoff destiny. That is in the hands of winning this game and also those Bills beating the New England Patriots. Solana, how nervous are you going into this week? Very very, very nervous. And uh, I think <laughs> I think the idea that the Dolphins, which I know we'll get to, brought in Mike Glennon, oh. and they've once again removed the ping pong table from their facility, tells you everything we need to know about how the Dolphins feel going into Sunday. Oh, yeah. If removing the ping pong table means you mean business. It, it wasn't it wasn't, you know, it wasn't quite the uh, the, the trip. By the way, what do they have that ping pong table in there for like a week? Because you know, they've been on the road for the for the damn uh, for most of this losing streak. So they're like, ah, you know what really got us? It wasn't to his concussion. It was, those damn ping- it was that damn ping pong table. Get rid Crazy. of the paddles. Get rid of the ping pong balls. No more table. No more fun. Time to lock in. Time yeah, to lock time, in. Toby. Time, time to, uh, enough, not, uh, <laughs> enough uh, you know, BSing going on in that locker room. Too much horsing around going on. I mean, it's what a joke, it, man. What a how joke. many times has that stupid ping pong table been reported on this year? I, I never want to hear about it. You know what? I hope next year it's bocce ball or like a, a pop a shot machine, something else. Like I just burn that ping pong table to the ground. Um, no, like it's seriously, it's it's laughable because if there was one story I didn't need to relive going into the most important game of the season when everything's gone wrong over the past five weeks, it's a stupid ping pong table. It's like the one thing we didn't need. And here we are again, talking about ping pong tables in the Dolphins locker room. I hope that they like just wheeled it out just for like the media session, just for room. And like, then we come back and somebody like Raekwon Davis is playing like ping pong by himself, like Forrest Gump on Instagram, <laughs> just something like that. Just to, just to really mess with everybody. Like That's the way- really, really tight shorts. Yep. Like extremely high shorts, tight polo, headband, and and he's just practicing against himself with the half the ping pong table up. What if what if just Tua took it for himself because he's not allowed to do anything else, so he's just off playing <laughs> ping pong and he's he's like, got he's got to focus on the day at hand, Tobin. That's what we know. He's got to focus on the day at hand. I love the uh, I love concussion protocols because it's like Mike McDaniel's like, hey, have you talked to Tua? No, I haven't talked about anything. Not no. allowed. Can't talk to him. It's like, you know, it reminds me of our program director. It's like, if you, uh, if you like have anything to say, no, can't talk about it. No, not telling you anything. I'm a lockbox. <laughs> uh, how was your day? Don't ask me that. How was my day? What? <laughs> Why don't you ask all to see how their day was? That's how it is. And McDaniel is like very serious. I, I have not had any conversation because the doctor told me that, I can't ask him about anything other than the day at hand. That's, That's it. Right. So don't ask me about Tua anymore. Enough with the Tua questions. You guys, you got so cute with your Byron Jones questions. Enough. No Tua questions. No nothing. This All right. Byron, I'll don't know. even remind me. Don't even remind me about Byron Jones. I mean, what? What? what a, just ridiculous. I mean, everybody knew Byron Jones wasn't going to play this year, and the Dolphins didn't go out and improve their secondary. And everybody knew Byron Jones was like, "Yeah, I'm not playing this year." It's just stringing and, us along. And and all season long, every week on Monday, McDaniel's asked about Byron Jones, and he tells you all season long, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about it at some point this season. And Byron Jones is sitting at home like, <laughs> I'm, I'm not coming back. He is, yeah, I'm feeling he's, good about it too, to the tune of $16 million guaranteed. <laughs> he's he's uh, Magic Johnson after he quit. I'm not going to be there. <laughs> uh, that's tough for you guys. He gets another ring. It's like, hey, uh, you think you can go this week? Zach isn't feeling good. He goes, I don't know about that. You know, uh, just I'm not feeling it right now. Sorry. You got that first round pick. Noah, what's his name? It'll be all right. <laughs> Second, that secondary is just depleted. Javon Holland's playing with half a spleen. He's just, he's trying to do whatever he can. He's got giant tight ends just rolling up all over him. Duke Riley doesn't know what the hell to do. <laughs> Duke Riley's put in every terrible situation this season. And there's a guy wide open you call timeout and they come back out and Javon Holland is just pointing like, yo, you got him. You got him. You got him. And Duke Riley is like me. I, I was, I've been on the bench all season. You want me to go cover their start or not star, but their best wide receiver. Me. 
Did you see that video, by the way, speaking of people not knowing where to be, did you see the video of Liam Eikenberg getting uh, blocking Brandon Shell's ass and falling all over himself? Yeah, I did. Yeah, Liam Eikenberg had a tough, uh, a tough return to the field. No, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it feels like Chris Gruden, uh, you know, those 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 two lineman picks that he had too high, not 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 turning out so hot. No, no, not not, not, not turning not. out so hot. I was wondering this, Solana, because let's let's do doomsday scenario right now. What do you think this is going to be? What do you think the reaction of Stephen Ross is going to be? if they don't make the playoffs yeah. with, with, with knowing that they have had unbelievable health problems. Do you feel like in a year where he was banished and the team lost a pick for tampering, do you feel like he's going to be reasonable or do you feel like he's going to want answers and someone's going to answer for, for these crimes of a, of a collapse? Like, how do you feel he goes about this? Because it's such a, it's such a hard answer. I don't know if there's a right answer. If you, if the Dolphins, legit, sometimes you laugh at teams when they try and make excuses. I would understand if the Dolphins came back to everybody and said, look where we were in the middle of the year. We're just starting this thing with like McDaniel. I feel like we're on the right path. Let's just run it back. And, you know, a lot of times you'll be like, that's stupid. Obviously, they got to fix some things on defense. But for, I'm talking like Tua you know, all the stars on offense, tweak a couple of things on defense. Or do you feel like this epic a collapse if they don't make the playoffs, somebody's got to go? So I, I have another question for you. When the Dolphins um, rebuilt, right, they went full tank mode for Tua and, and they started that three-year rebuild process, Tobin, a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. Do you think Steven Ross still believes that they're in the middle of this rebuild process or because they've ended up firing the head coach, because to me that plays into it, right? You started basically brand new. You brought in a new head coach. Does that give you an extra year or two to figure it out? Or was the head coach no longer part of this rebuild process? And we should be at the point in the rebuild process already that you're a playoff team competing because to that, me, that's what's important. How does Stephen Ross feel yeah. about it? Because, right, Chris Greer must have framed it to him as, listen, nothing's going our way. We have to revamp everything. We have to start from scratch. And they did it. And guess what? When you, when you consider where they were at, three first-round picks, they got the guy that they thought would be their franchise quarterback. And then two straight years after that, uh, that draft, they're in a position where they could have made the playoffs. Okay, you fire the head coach. You bring in a new head coach, but you already felt like you're on the precipice of being a, a team that can compete for the AFC and the AFC East. All you have to do is improve the offense. Well, Stephen Ross is thinking, well, hold on a second. I brought in the head coach. Clearly, our mm -hmm. offense was much improved. Like th This is year three after that rebuild. Why haven't I seen results yet? And, and I think that's what matters. Where does Stephen Ross feel like the the addition of a new head coach comes into play is it well the rebuild you know forget about that because we brought in a new head coach or hey the new head coach was supposed to be that that part of climbing the mountaintop finally and getting over the hump of a middling team so if it if, if that didn't work well then you know what the hell are we doing here what our rebuild failed that's an interesting question for Chris Greer, I think. Like, look, I think for right. Mike McDaniel, it's his first season. I think that if he was tasked with, hey, can you get to uh, anything out of him? Can you can you make this guy – can you salvage this? This is broken. Can you salvage this? I would say he absolutely did that. There's no question about it. The only thing that was standing into his way was his brain health. Um, but as far as Mike McDaniel – putting the confidence back into him, putting an offense around him that worked a system that worked that, uh, that has been answered. I think the question then goes to Chris Greer for, for this rebuild, which it is over. Like if you trade all your picks and you know, all the fruits of the Laramie Tunsil deal and all of that stuff, you go in a Bradley Chubb and you give him a big deal and Tyree kill and all that stuff. And, some good, some bad, you know, that's a lot of the ways that the draft game works. I think that the question for Steven Ross is going to be like, 
all right, do I trust that this is going to work out? Do I still follow through? Because I feel like it's more of a I, – I know Mike McDaniel definitely deserves some criticism for some things that have fallen apart, but, you know, it is a, it is a hard ask to say, hey, can you go – get us into the playoffs and you also didn't have your quarterback for four and a half games. Um, even with the losing streak being what it is, I think you could say hey, this guy did, did a lot of good things his first year, knowing that he has to develop. Greer is going to be an interesting one. Cause it feels like he's been on such a roller coaster of people hate him, love him, hate him, love him, hate him, love him. Um, and, and where do you think that's at? Cause obviously I think everybody's pissed at everybody right now in the fan base, but for him, it's not like he's been this beloved figure his entire time down here. People wanted him gone basically up until the Tyreek Hill trade, you know? And I think right. anybody would tell you, well, uh, what GM wouldn't go trade for Tyreek Hill? You know, as far as his draft evaluation, you know, it's been here, it's been there. Uh, you know, we've talked about the lineman whiffs, the Noah whiffs. This guy's been around for a long time. So is it as simple as he'd be a fall guy? People seem to really like working with him. People seem to really dig him. He's obviously been around for a lot of regimes. Is it as simple as Josh Boyer would get the ax? Because I think that's probably the easy, the easy one. If anybody's yeah. going to be the fall guy. And and you could also do the same thing with Boyer as we've done with McDaniel, right? What defensive coordinator would be able to replicate what we saw in the last eight weeks of last season that, you know, elite defense with half their secondary gone. Right. Like you, you could do the same thing we're doing with sure. Daniel with Josh Boyer. And, and I mean, listen, I don't think anybody's caping up for Josh Boyer. I'm not, but I also don't think that the defense falling off as much as it has is simply because Josh Boyer sucks. Like I, I do think injuries come into play, but there's also a lot more to it because this defense in times, like you saw the other day, just looks inept in, 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 in positions or in situations of a game where you can't, you can't look that way. Like if you get beat because the other team just outplayed you, fine. But to have a, a player out of a timeout wide open in the most important play of the game, and he ends up catching the touchdown, and it's stupid McCorkle who threw it to him. God, like, him. It, like it just, it, you know, th those are, and, and that's not the only situation. Like, you know, there's been a handful of situations this year that we can go through where you're, you're thinking to yourself, like, what the hell is Josh Boyer doing? Like, but why why is why is that happening? But but Tobin, um like Chris Greer, while you can make the argument that he's whiffed on too many draft picks, his time here has come, right? This rebuild didn't work out the way that he wanted it to work out. Aren't we just going to revert back to the same trap that we've fallen into for two decades, which is okay, you bring in a GM, well, the head coach gets fired because after two or three seasons it doesn't work. And then after a couple seasons, you fire that GM. And now you have a head coach with a GM that he didn't pick. And then, again, you fire the head coach. And now the GM goes and he, he hires his head coach. And then you're, you're just kind of going through that same cycle again, which yeah. is two different – a general manager and a head coach that weren't brought in together. Again, you know what I mean? So um, I think that also is something Stephen Ross would have to play into because that's been a cycle – that the Dolphins have known for a long time. Who's in charge? Who has say? Was it Adam Gates? Was it Chris Greer? Um, you know, was it uh, Tony Sperano? Was it um, Ireland Parcells? Ireland Parcells. Like who? What? What was the the hierarchy there? Right. And, yeah. No. And it once, definitely. It's been an issue because you're doing half fixes, and I don't think that Mike McDaniel. I don't think he warrants getting fired this year. And I don't. I agree. I, I agree. don't. I'm fascinated to see what they do with Tua. I mean, I don't, I feel like Tua has proven a lot of stuff this year, but one of the concerns people have had is his durability and his health. And, you know, it feels like if it's not one thing, it's another every single year. And I'm not, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. That's really all it is. It's not an indictment of him, but it is a question of like, okay, this is going to kind of be the make or break it. Do they invest in him after this year? Do they pick up his option? Do they wait? Um, how can I, you, how can you, how, how can you invest in him long-term if next season, because he's going to be the quarterback next season, unless something insane happens, right? Where you're able to convince Lamar Jackson or like, like it would have to be something big like that because you're not going to go out. Everybody talking about Jimmy G. I mean, that's ridiculous. 
you're, you're not, not going to go out. I, you're I not going to get Carr. Like none of that makes sense for the Dolphins right now. You're better no, off. No, it needs to be. Tua yeah, it needs. I, I'm not. I've never been into Tom Brady, but it's going to be. If you're going off of Tua, it has to be something seismic, and it's right. It comes down to probably three. It's not Derek Carr. Get the hell out of here. It's not Jimmy G. It would have to be Lamar Jackson. I would say him or Aaron Rodgers, or if they go back to the Tom Brady, well, it's going to be something. And I'm not saying I'm for that or against it. I'm saying like that is what's going to cause them to make the move. It's not going to be. But even even Brady Tobin, like okay, fine, Brady next year you can make the argument that he gives you a better chance than Tua. Like, fine, we can do that, right? But that means you're done with the Tua Tungabailoa era for a quarterback you're going to have one season who's 45. Mm, like, yeah. I, 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 can't, I, think, I, I don't get that. I don't. Get I don't that. I, well, here's the thing that you have to get, though. He's 83 as an owner. You know, he's old. He's, he's you know, only, you know, and I think that's what it comes down. He's clearly had his eye on him forever. I don't like it. Aaron Rodgers, you know, always some weird stuff going on there in Green Bay. You never know when it's going to be. It feels like that that could happen at any time. And then Lamar Jackson is obviously the hometown story, and he's been at a contract impasse with the team for a while. So I feel like those are the guys it would come down to that could – that you have. I, I think that the Dolphins have a meeting about it. Mike McDaniel, Chris Greer, all of them. If you're, if you're Stephen Ross, you're like – Derek Carr, Jimmy G, like, no, he he's going to do it for a star. He's going to do it for somebody. Because one thing that we have to recognize, Tua is very popular amongst the fan base. There's a lot of people who are, you know, haters. I think they're a very loud minority. But I think the guy ultimately is very, very popular amongst the fan base. And I think that if you're going to convince people, it's going to have to be a lot like they did this year with the Brian Flores thing is where, oh, we have, we're going to this shameful thing where we're getting sued by our former coach. Hey, everybody, we got you Tyreek Hill. Ah, you see? Like, it needs to be something that really has you forget that two is gone, if that's yeah. the way they go. But I think if they don't, no, I think he's done I think he's done enough to say, hey, I, I think with him and this coach and these weapons, if he stays healthy, it's just a big if. But, yeah, I think the, the guy – on the football field, I think we have shown is is good enough to get them some games and, and good enough to win them uh, a lot of games and put up a lot of points and put up a lot of stats. He had a good season. It comes down to, do you believe Tua can stay healthy, though? Yeah, and how do we answer that? How is it possible to answer it in this sport that is, is somebody healthy? Like, And how squirrely is this with concussions? Like, We have now seen three different scenarios with concussions. We have seen him get one during a game, come back and win it. We have seen him literally get his body shut down, frozen and get stretched off a field. And we saw one that went unrecognized and we didn't realize that he had a concussion until after the game. So how and do you this, know? And and this will stay with him for the rest of his career, right? Like yes. five years, five years from now, Tua takes a hit and he kind of stays on the ground a little bit. Well, guess what? He's going to miss three or four games just based mm -hmm. on, you know, precedence now where he has head injuries. And, you know, I mean, like we, we found out that on Monday, the reason why they put him in concussion protocol after Green Bay was because uh, he, he didn't remember certain things from the game. Like, right. you know what I mean? Like, like all, all that matters now because next year if, if he takes a hit, well, you know what's going to happen. The Dolphins are going to feel like they're in a position because of what happened this season. Like they can't put him out there, even if he he goes through and he passes concussion protocol because of the precedent that's been set with him. So I think that comes into play too, where even if he's healthy, fine. But all it takes is that one hit where he's on the ground. And even if he doesn't have a concussion, you have now the pressure from the fan base, the pressure from the league, and just the pressure from like an ethics standpoint of what are you doing to this guy? Yeah, and that's a tough place to be in because the the Dolphins were already in a place this year where they were scrutinized for it, feeling like they were covering some things up, um, which I don't think that they were. I'm just saying, like, that's that's how they were treated. And, yeah. uh, you know, they've had two investigations now from the NFLPA into how they handled two of concussions. So I don't know. I don't know if that's something they want to deal with forever when it comes to this guy. I mean, and then have that, you know, 
searching for a better term, but that cloud that hangs over him. Um, Cause you know, ultimately when the guy plays football, I, I think, you know, he can do some really, really exciting stuff. Him and Waddle and Tyreek were a fun connection this year. We're talking about franchise records that were put up with this guy, at quarterback, um, a super explosive offense all over the place. So, it's a look. They have a lot of questions. I, I I I find it to be so critical that they make the playoffs this week in Solana, and it sucks that it's not in their hands because I feel like it it softens the blow so much if they are able to get in there and he's able to play in a playoff game because you're like, all right, we can now just look at the season as a whole. If they don't make the playoffs, it's tough. It's going to be tough for anybody to think about anything but the collapse, and I understand why. Yeah. No, I mean, it would be the worst collapse maybe in South Florida sports history. And it's hard, it's hard to come back from that. Um, I'm, I'm with you on everything you said about McDaniel. I think he's proven enough. I think it would be crazy to get rid of him after a year when clearly, I mean, he's well-respected. People now believe that he can be a really good head coach in the league. And I think he's proven that. Uh, but Tobin, I, I'm not confident about this Sunday, and I hope I'm wrong. You know, How but could I'm, you be? I'm, like, I'm not confident about this Sunday at all, man, at all. And, and you know, what, what, what happened with DeMar Hamlin, I mean, that's devastating, right? But just looking at it, I know it's hard to do. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to push that aside. I mean, um, that, that, that's a crazy story. It's tragic, and I'm, I'm wishing the absolute best for him. But just from a Dolphin standpoint, which is a lot less important, I know, but, like, well, if this Sunday Buffalo has to go play the Patriots, like you're you're expecting that team to suit up on Sunday and go out there and 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 just perform like they always do, you know what? I, like really, like I mean, I don't know yeah, what that's the NFL. Tough, is I do. don't know. Who knows? I mean, like listen, right. they could be coming. They could galvanize around it and they could go kill the the Patriots because they're just so, you know, they need a release because they've been, right. you know, they're not talking. At least they didn't talk to the media. We're doing this on a Wednesday night, so I don't think I don't know if they're gonna talk to the media this week. I don't know how that's gonna all work, but yeah, that's it. it, it look, you have your your brother sitting in a hospital bed right now. I would totally understand if they didn't want to play yeah. in a long time. I mean, it's 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 a real, real unfortunate domino effect that they it, it, or even reasonable that they have to go figure that out. Um, but you know. <sighs> from you know the dolphins in this perspective like yeah you're going into a situation this week with a third string quarterback a guy who was drafted late who impressed the holy hell out of everybody in the preseason hasn't really done that in the regular season uh the dolphins to their you know if you want to to their defense have not had a game with a backup quarterback where they've just had one backup quarterback every game <laughs> somebody gets hurt in the middle of that game. No quarterback who's not Tua can just seemingly play a game. Um, so I go into it thinking, okay, the best thing is go through this week, prep Skyler as the starter. Hope he doesn't poop the bed. And if he does, maybe Bridgewater's th pinky's okay enough to play. But I just don't know if Teddy's like, I don't know if I – it's tough to know like what the gap is there right now between a banged up Teddy Bridgewater and a well-prepped Skylar Thompson against this Jets defense, which by the way, has been awesome this season. Yeah. And, and they want to win this game. Like this isn't a game where they're going to, you know, they're going to bench their, their starters. Like the Jets want to play spoiler to the dolphins. Why wouldn't you? We did it. We did it. Ted Ginn With Jr. Patriots. had his best game ever and played spoiler. We played spoiler to the Patriots too, to keep them out of the one seed in the bye. They end up losing to Tennessee a couple years ago. And uh, and and we've we played spoiler of the Jets a couple times already. So um, you know they're they're going to be up for this game. They're pissed they didn't make the playoffs, and they're going to want to come and ruin Miami season. Um, I saw Rob but, Sala's uh, quote this week because him and McDaniel yeah. are super close, and he goes, "Yeah, I hope he joins me poolside." I'm like, "Damn, that is that is a jerk thing to say, but also funny." Yeah. I got to respect. Yeah, him. very funny, very funny. You got to uh, ruin your you want to ruin your friend's winter. You know, no no fun for you. Yeah, Salas, he needs somebody to go through all of those receipts with. I'm going to tell you something all right those now. receipts he was wrong about. Let me tell you something, Salah. You're not invited to Fountain Blue. You spoil the playoffs, all right? You are right. not invited. We're, yeah. we're not. I'm going to make sure Garfinkel keeps you off the list, dude. All right? You're going to have to go somewhere like, I don't know. like uh, Cancun. The, Cancun. Can't, Get yeah, out you're, not, you're not allowed down here, Salah. I'm sorry, yeah. dude. You can't, yeah. you can't just bounce the Dolphins from the playoffs and think that's going to be acceptable. I'm not accepting that. 
So, you know, Mike Glennon, though, you know, that's a that's a great uh, emergency plan. Did anything make you sadder this season? Did you see the stats about Mike Glennon? Hasn't won a game since 2017. He's like 10 and 350 in his NFL record. Something something dumb like that. I mean, they brought would, in maybe the biggest loser of all time to be on their practice squad. What's the pay-per-view price? What's the hard, what's the pay-per-view price you would pay for a hard knocks version of Chris Greer? going through the quarterback Rolodex and then ending up on Mike Lennon. Like who, how many, first of all, how many quarterbacks does he call before he gets to Mike Lennon? Like, is there, do you think there's a Fitzpatrick in the middle of there? Is there a Cutler? Like, you know, listen, Chris Greer has been through a lot of quarterbacks since he's been here. Does he call up Matt Moore? Like who are the guys he gets to before they're like, you know what? I don't want your $64,000. And then you get to Mike Lennon and he goes, sure. <laughs> I love the idea of big Ben being on that list. Philip oh. Rivers, Philip Rivers, just like uh, uh, he he goes and he's like, we can probably convince Philip Rivers. Come back one week. We need one win. Come back. Dial it up, dude. Just let's yeah. see what you got. You you can do this, Philip. Like, just be a hero. And maybe you don't even need to be. You know, just if you need you, you a little break last of emergency. If not, here's sixty five k. No biggie. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and and he he calls up Big Ben. He's like, hey, I know Steelers guy. He never played anywhere else. But look, look, look what they did. They forced you out for Kenny Pickett. Yep. I mean, come back, come back one game and help us dude. win this one. And Big Ben's just like knocking down a brew. He's like, ah, I'm good. Yeah. It's, it's I'm exactly right. like when Adam Gates called up Jay Cutler back in the day. Jay Cutler's just got a pack of smokes. He goes, uh, 10 million, I'll do it. I guess. All right. But that's the thing is like, it's not for 10 million. It's like, what's the minimum? And it's like, oh, listen, 65,000 is nothing to sneeze at for the rest of us. But I'm saying like, just for NFL, Mike Lennon's made some money. It's just like, all right, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. When, when do I get? When, I think he said he was at like his son's basketball game. He's like watching Junior, and he's like bricking shots. He goes, "Listen, son, I don't think I'm going to make the next one. I'm uh, I'm going to miss this weekend. I got to suit up for the Dolphins, maybe." Ryan Fitzpatrick was a hundred percent discussed, though, right? Like that. That was a discussion. Ryan Fitzpatrick called himself. Ryan Fitzpatrick <laughs> called up. He goes, "Hey, Chris." I'm ready when you need me, buddy. You know, he's got a Text, stupid. Texted him. Texted Definitely. him a pick. Definitely. He probably called Gasecki. Gasecki, can put in a good word. I'm ready. I'm tired <laughs> of sitting next to this Whitworth. I'll throw you, I'll throw you 10 passes on Sunday if you get me in there. I'll throw you 10, I'll throw you 20 passes, Gasecki, if you get me in there. Do you think Gasecki thinks to himself and he goes, Man, I really like Tua as a guy, but like he like I seem to only have my good games when he's not in there. <laughs> Like he doesn't think, really look in Zeki's way. Yeah, I think I think he is so unless he's throwing a pick in the Packers game. Correct. I think he is so ready. He is so ready to get paid this offseason that he's just smiling through it all, baby. He's he's LeBron, just smiling through it all. And and he he knows he knows the paycheck is coming. Maybe not ten million like he would have gotten this offseason, but it's it, it'll be it'll be a nice chunk of change for Gasecki. So I'm I'm not even joking, Tobin, at this stage in the in, in the season. He probably is prioritizing health over everything else. Like, all right, fine. Throw me out there for six six plays. Whatever. I'll stay healthy. All good. I do wonder, though, like, the, the, uh, like you get that, you know, it was such a storyline going into this year about them not locking him up, and he gets franchised, which is great. You make a lot of money. $10 million, like, sign me up. But, you know, everybody wants to get that long-term deal, and you have this – immediate marriage that's awkward and doesn't seem to be working. And it's known like from the second week of camp that he's not, you know, doing things to the coach's liking. Um, and like, how does that not affect your value? Like you go in from a season where you are, everybody looks at you as one of the bright unsung tight ends. And now one of the problems is when you're unsung and then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, you were kind of forgotten by your own team this year. Doesn't that kill his market going into this summer? I mean, obviously he's not going to stay here. That's very clear. He's going to move on to something else. But I, I, I wonder what that does for him in the market. I don't think it does because I mean, I, I don't think he's you know as as sought after as maybe he would have been this off season. But Tobin, I don't think it does because I think most people know that he's a pass catcher and he was really good at it when he was playing. And Mike McDaniel just didn't use him. Like I, I think most people realize that. You know, feels like that, he's got he's got Chicago Bears written all over him. For sure. For sure. Chicago or even, Bear. even even Jets. 
Jets oh. overpay him. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's how Mike White is gonna become a pro bowler. Give him a Gasicki. Go ahead. Go ahead, New York. All right. That's our porpoise pot, everybody. We uh, you know, it's it was a rough day for all Dolphin fans who had to learn about Mike Lennon. And of course a rough day for the ping pong table. But we're smiling through it all, as Solana said, just like LeBron, who didn't have the guts to play the heat tonight. And which, by the way, I mean, come on, really, dude? Uh, I have a cold. Like, come on. He's, you don't want to get embarrassed a, again? Nah, he doesn't want Bam. He doesn't want to go up against Bam tonight, Tobin. That's what. Oh, that's really oh. what it is. He's afraid of old Bamski. Oh, man. I hate – I honestly, I hated the fact that uh, – who knows? When you guys listen to this game, it'll be over. But I hate the fact that he's out tonight because, like, this just means, like, that stupid uh, Austin Reeves is going to go off for, like, 17 yeah. threes. Yeah. I yeah, know, no, know this story. <laughs> we know exactly. That this is going to be a clutch game. And uh, and the Heat are battling back in the fourth quarter, a hundred percent. Yeah, that's what the Heat do. Yeah, we, we just so you know, we picked all this before tip off, and the Heat definitely going to give up a fifteen point lead that they had, and at some point it's going to end. It's going to be within three points. And Russell yeah. Russell Westbrook has a triple double tonight. Kendrick uh-huh. Nunn hasn't played in three months. He'll have twenty two and five against the Heat tonight. All right, man. That's our purpose spot, everybody. We'll talk to you next time.